The reading from today is from 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, we'll read verse 12 to the end of the chapter. If you're here last week, you'll note that we're reading some of what we covered last week, but we're, the final three verses of this chapter is where we will give our attention this morning. Peter writes, beginning in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who also suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Chapter 4, verse 17. How should we react? How, how should we, as God's people, respond to God's judgment? What is the goal or purpose of our suffering according to the will of God? That's the, the greater context here that we have been considering in 1 Peter chapter 4. And this passage and this particular section of this passage from Peter helps us put the questions surrounding temporary suffering in proper perspective. What Peter says here, quite plainly, is that God's judgment begins from his own family, from his children, and then reaches out to others who are not part of his family. And when it reaches out, it reaches out in a very severe fashion to those who do not obey the gospel. But one of the things that Peter is making clear here in this passage is that there are two distinct... I could see the reflection of a yellow jacket in my hair. The reflections in my iPad. One of the things that Peter is making clear, there are two distinct groups of people, the house of God and those who disobey the gospel. There are believers and unbelievers. And Peter is helping us answer the questions that swirl in our mind regarding temporary suffering, helping us to put them in proper perspective and understand what it is that God is doing. And we've seen already that the suffering that we face, the difficulties in this life are, are not just happenstance. They're not just showing up accidentally, but there is a God who is in control of all things, orchestrating them for the good of his people and the glory of his name. In essence, what we want to walk away from with this passage is how to suffer the judgment of God by entrusting ourselves to him. The summary is in verse 19. Those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. But I think if we're all honest... When we first read verse 17, there are a lot of questions that we have about what does it mean that judgment, it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. I thought as a result of being Christians, we would not suffer judgment. Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Christ. 
And so it's helpful for us to make a couple of distinctions here. Peter is not contradicting Paul or the rest of the scriptures. It is time for judgment to begin with or from the household of God. It begins with God's people. But we need to understand what this judgment is. We must understand it rightly. It's remedial judgment, not final judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation. That is final judgment. The Christian will never undergo final judgment from God. But we will experience remedial judgment along the way. The judgment of God is intended to be a remedy or a cure for us, for our sinfulness. It purifies us. It's the purging fire of discipline that we saw in verses 12 and following last week. As opposed to the final judgment, which comes at the end. That is, not the purging fire of discipline, but the all-consuming wrath of God that is inescapable for those who do not obey the gospel. So this judgment for God's people is purification. And judgment for those who do not belong to God is punishment. Eternal and everlasting punishment. So Peter is quite clear with the statement here. It's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. He is specifically referring to the church. We can go back to chapter 2, verse 5, when he's writing to the original recipients, those who are Christians. And he says, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. So Peter is writing to us. It's time for judgment to begin with us. It's time for remedial judgment for purifying discipline to begin with the church, with God's people. We can succinctly say it this way. The judgment of God commences with Christians. Peter's not the only biblical writer that references this. Listen to Amos 3.2. You only... Have I chosen among all the families of the earth? Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Or think about the more familiar story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. As a result of them hiding the truth from God's people, attempting to hide it from God, they were struck dead. And Luke writes, great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things because the judgment began with the church, with God's people. Or fast forward a couple of chapters in the book of Acts chapter 8, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. In chapter 1, God had said to his disciples, that the Holy Spirit would come down and that they would be his witnesses throughout the entire earth, not just in Jerusalem. Time has gone by. Many people have been saved and the church is still simply gathered there in Jerusalem. So what does God do in his sovereignty? He sends persecution. What happens when persecution comes to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8? They're scattered out. And Acts 8, 4 tells us that those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. They eventually became obedient as a result of the discipline of the Lord, as a result of the remedial judgment. And again, Malachi chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 9, these passages deal with God's discipline, God's judgment, his remedial dealings and purifying dealings with his people. But one of the most common, most famous places that we see this happening is in Isaiah 63. And I want to spend some time considering Isaiah 63 this morning because the truths that we find there are very similar to what we see playing out in the letter of 1 Peter. When the prophet is prophesying in the days of Isaiah 63, God's people are in Babylon. They're in bondage. 
to their enemies. And First Peter, in, in a very real sense, serves as a commentary of sorts on chapter 63, verses 7 and following. And note some of the similarities. 63, verse 7. I shall make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his loving kindnesses. You have to think back six or eight months ago, but you remember how First Peter begins, just basking and, and reveling in the glorious news of the gospel. That God has saved us, that by his loving kindness, he has regenerated us and given us new life. And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying here in verse 7 of chapter 63. And then verse 8, for he said, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. In verse 9, chapter 63 of Isaiah, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them and carried them all the days of old. This is what God has done for his people. This is what God has done for us. God has saved us. How have we responded? How are we responding to the good news that God has saved us from our sins? I hope that we are determined to respond better than the folks in Isaiah's day. I hope that we will not be found out to respond in the way that they responded to the loving kindness and the praises of the Lord and being filled with his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindness, being saved by him. But if you continue reading with me in verse 10 of chapter 63, you see their response. And, and their response helps us understand why Peter says that judgment, it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God, with God's people. Again, remember the context. In all their affliction, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. But... But they rebelled and grieved his spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. This is a hard verse for us to wrap our minds around. They rebelled. Notice the way that Isaiah writes it. Not God dropped them along the way. Not God changed his mind about the promises that he had made. They rebelled. They reneged. They dropped the ball. They failed to keep their side of the covenant. They disobeyed him. They grieved his Holy Spirit by rejecting him and rejecting his law. They turned their backs on him. They took up false gods. They served idols. The psalmist said it this way in 106.19. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a molten image. They exchanged the glory, their glory, for the image of an ox that eats grass. They rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Verse 10. Therefore, God turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. It's time for judgment to begin from the household of God. It's always been that way. Israel's defeats recorded for us on the pages of the scriptures. They were never, ever the result of the strength or power of their enemies. Israel's defeats were always because of their own rebellion. Because they grieved God. Because they were disobedient. The might of the enemy never mattered 
It never would have mattered if God had been on their side. And the same is true for us today. We're very glad to wave the flag in Romans 8 that if God is for us, who could be against us? But if that is true, and it is, then is it not also true that if God is against us, it doesn't matter who or what is for us? Isaiah 63, 10 says, He turned and became their enemy. 1 Peter 4, 17, It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God from the church. Just like Israel of old, our problem as the church today is not the power of our enemies. The problem within the church of our day is not the clever tactics of the lost. Our problem within the church today is not the media and all their biases. Our problem in the church today is not the ongoing political debacle in Richmond or in D.C. Our problem as the church today is not the success in the prosperity gospel or easy believism or seeker sensitive or purpose driven. Our problem as the church today is not any of these issues. There have always been enemies against the Lord and against his people. Our major problem as God's people today is our own fickle folly. We must be willing to come to the text and to ask ourselves, have we acted as Israel of old? Have we turned from God? Have we turned from his word? Have we turned to other gods? Have we turned to our own ideas and our own notions of what it means to worship him? And to belong to him. If we have. If we do. God will turn. And he will become our enemy. And he will fight against us. It is time Peter says. For judgment to begin. From the house of God. What other reason is there. For the atrocious situation. Of the professing church across our land. Where can we place the blame for the desolate circumstances that are spread so broad throughout our country? Consider with me the absurdity of assuming that the apparent impotence of the church today is because her enemies are so numerous or so vast or so strong or so clever or so heartless, or so left-leaning. You could go on and on. It would be the same as saying that the problem with the church is that God is small, or weak, or incapable, or unconcerned, or vulnerable. And the condition of the church in our land today is not a result of God being too small. The condition of the church in our day is not a result of the world being too strong. Verse 10 describes the problem precisely. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Have we? Have we rebelled against his word? Have we grieved him and his spirit? Has he turned to become the enemy of the church? Is he fighting against us? Now, we don't really want to believe this. I mean, I, I, I can feel the need to want to squirm out from under some of these realities. I mean, surely we can blame the current condition of the evangelical climate on something else, on someone else, anyone, anything but our own disobedience. Anyone, anything but our own rebellion, anyone, anything other than our own idolatry. And it isn't, I don't think, I'm pretty convinced that it's not that we don't perceive the problem. We can sense that and we can see it. It's that too often we're confused about the solution, which is where the prophet Isaiah is immensely helpful because he knew the solution. 
And this is what responding to judgment should look like. If it's time for judgment to begin from the household of God, and Peter says it is, then how then should we respond? What should our response look like? How can we be certain that our response is, verse 19, that we suffer according to the will of God and that we entrust our souls to a faithful creator by doing what is right, by having lives that are marked by righteousness? Let's continue reading in chapter 63, verses 11 through 14. Then, you see the action, God has saved his people. They rebelled and grieved. He turned to fight against them. Then his people remembered the days of old. We begin to see why God judges his people, why there's remedial judgment, why there's purifying discipline, because it brings about help and hope for the people of God. His people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths like a horse in the wilderness? They did not stumble. As the cattle which go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. This is what responding to the judgment of God should look like. Remembering the victorious one. Remembering him who has conquered all his enemies. And all your enemies if you're his. This is what responding to the discipline of the Lord is like. Responding to suffering in our day and time. Is remembering the one who lifted up his own. Who carried his people through all the days of old. Through the wilderness. In the desert. Across the sea. This is what responding to judgment looks like. Asking the question, where is he? Where is God? Where is this all-powerful one? Where is this God of glorious deliverance? This God of glorious guidance who leads and teaches and carries his people. Where is he? He's a God who does not change. We know that he hasn't changed. Where then is he? He parted the Red Sea. And they crossed on dry ground. Where is that God? He divided the Jordan. Where is he? He led his people with a pillar of fire by day, by night and cloud by day. Where is this God? He provided manna from heaven, water from a rock. Where is he? This God who scattered all his foes. Where is he? He gave his children rest on all sides. He made a glorious name for himself. Where is he? That's the response of God's people in the days of Isaiah. Where is he? Where is his sovereignty in choosing a people so unworthy of his love? Where is his power bringing them out of a much stronger nation who held them in bondage? Where is his care for 40 years providing their every want? Where is his faithfulness bringing them at last to the promised land? Is he not the same God now? Will he he do less for his people now? Will he not do for the souls of his people now for us what he did for his people then? Where is he? Do we not need him like this to deliver us from bondage? To deliver us from sin and self in this world. Do we not need the Holy Spirit to be in our midst. Guiding us, instructing us and teaching us. Do we not need his right arm making a name for himself among us. Leading us through the depths. As verse 13 says. Without even stumbling. Do we not need him dwelling among us. Giving us rest. Upholding his honor among us. The response was to look up, to look to God, who is our help in the midst of the remedial judgment that they were suffering. But that's not enough to ask the question, where is he? Continue reading verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirrings of your heart and your compassion are restrained toward me. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel doesn't recognize us. You, O Lord, are our father. 
Our Redeemer from old is your name. Why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people possessed your sanctuary for a little while. Our adversaries have trodden it down. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. It's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Look down, the people in Isaiah's day begged. Look down from your holy and glorious habitation. They realize his glory. They realize his transcendence that he's above them in every way imaginable. They're aware of who he is and the holiness that characterizes him. They're aware of the glory that surrounds him. And so they ask, where are your zeal? Where are your mighty deeds? Don't hold them to yourself anymore, but use them for the sake of your people. They're pleading the covenant promises here in verse 16. You are our father, not Abraham. Not Israel, not Jacob. You, O Lord, are our only hope. You're our Redeemer. Your zeal, your mighty deeds, the stirrings of your heart and your compassions, where are they? You've drawn near before. The people of God knew the experiential kindnesses of the Lord. Look down from heaven, they say. Will you not draw near again? You're our Father. You're our Redeemer. But you've been so much more. You've drawn near and we've lived with that kind of closeness and intimacy. Why are the stirrings of your heart towards us and your compassion for us restrained? Please, God, they say, don't hold them back anymore. Open the portals of heaven and let the stirrings of your heart towards your people flood our souls. The way that the hymnist said it, mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Your compassions are restrained. God, why? Why do you cause us to stray from your ways? Verse 17. Why do you lead us astray? Why do you harden us? Return, O Lord. This is more of asking, show us why. Show us why we continue to walk away. Reveal the sin in us and reveal the Savior all the more. We possessed your sanctuary for a little while, but our adversaries have now trodden it down. We've known your kindness. We've met with you. You've joined us there. We experienced your manifest glory. And now it's all rubble. In fact, we've become, verse 19, Isaiah 63, like those over whom you've never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. Because of the kindness of the Lord, the people of God are confessing. We look more like the world than like your people. Which is why they're asking, where is he? And asking, where is your zeal and your mighty deeds? And where is your compassion towards us? Please return and draw near. We knew your presence for a little while. But now the sanctuary is trampled and we look more like the world than your people. What will our response be? It's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. How will we respond? Peter offers us motivation for responding to God's judgment. Isaiah here offers a pattern for how we should respond to the judgment of God. One thing that Peter definitely makes certain is that it would be foolish for us to think that we will somehow escape this judgment. The judgment of God that Peter is talking about here that begins as remedial judgment within the church and becomes final judgment on those who are outside the church is absolutely crucial for us to understand that it is inescapable. When we experience the judgment of God, when we experience the purifying discipline of God, when the fiery ordeals are in our lives, we must see it as the beginning of a more severe judgment. 
Not severe for us if we're in Christ, but severe for those who do not obey the gospel. For those who do not take seriously the judgment of God. Judgment will not only overtake them in the end. It will also be their end. If you're not in Christ this morning, you will never know anything but this final judgment. Look at the way that Peter states it here. What will be the outcome? If it begins with us first, rhetorical, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then it's personified using a proverb. If it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? If even Christians have to deal with, with the judgment of God, imagine what it's like for those who are outside of Christ, is what Peter is saying. And there's no answer given here. To the question, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? No answer is given. We should hear it as a terrible silence. Too awful to even mention. They will come. Those who do not obey the gospel will come to an end in this judgment. And it will endlessly be on them forever and ever. If you're not in Christ, you will come to an end in this final judgment. And it will endlessly be on you forever and ever. But there's hope in Christ. You can run to him and find forgiveness for your sins. The example of the individual in verse 18 that we looked at. Is helpful motivation for the child of God because if we need such refining work and we do then those who do not belong to God will face a terribly awful end no matter how difficult being saved is it's not difficult for you and me Christ gave his life but no matter how difficult being saved is, there's no comparison to not being saved. This is the way the Apostle Paul says it. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And that's the glory that awaits those who are in Christ. For the church, for God's family. Therefore, in summary, Peter is wrapping up this entire concept of suffering for the believer as a result of the sin that still indwells us and the fallenness of the culture and society around us. Therefore, those who also suffer, verse 19, 1 Peter 4, therefore those also who suffer according to the will of God, shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. This is the pattern that Christ has laid out for us. Even Peter mentions that. Chapter 2, verse 23. Christ kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he's our example. We walk in his steps, following the path that he has trod, doing what is right, which we've seen again and again is in chapter 2, verse 15, and verse 20, and chapter 3, verse 6, and 17. So, how do we react? How do we respond to the judgment of God? If you're not in Christ, the only response is to run to Him. To run to Christ, who is the only safe refuge from the judgment of God. And if you're in Christ, you will escape the final judgment. Unquestionably, Christ suffered it on your behalf. But the remedial judgment, the fiery ordeals, the suffering in this life, the difficulties, the difficulties, 
the suffering must be according to the will of God. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, if you've put your trust in him, keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, keeping our chins up, as it were, looking at him who sits enthroned in the heavens, not on the things that are on earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You've been united to him by faith. So we suffer God's judgment. We suffer the difficulties as Christians here in this life by entrusting ourselves to him, to God in Christ. Peter is putting all the questions that swirl in our minds due to the difficulty in this life. Why suffering? Why now? He helps us put them in proper perspective. Teaching us this. The fires of God's judgment will not destroy us. But actually they are what save us. Just like the floodwaters in the days of Noah. The flood didn't destroy those who were in the ark, but it floated the boat. It saved them. The believer is saved by God and from God. Back in Isaiah 63, God reminds his people what he's done for them, how he saved them, how he carried them, how he provided for them. He reminds them of how they broke the covenant and turned of, and rebelled and grieved and then how he responded. And his response was disciplinary in order to make them realize what they had had and now lost. And so they cried out asking, where is this God? And begging him to look down. But by the end of chapter 63 and moving into chapter 64, they had realized that just a glance from heaven would not do. They wanted more, not just a peek from the portals of heaven. But they say in verse 1 of chapter 64, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes the water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. They didn't want just a glance. They didn't want to know just that God was up there somewhere. They wanted him to rend the heavens and come down. May we respond to the judgment of God, to the remedial discipline of God, to the fiery ordeals among us in the same kind of way, asking where is he, looking for him and his glory, Expecting his strong right arm to be displayed among us. Expecting his zeal to be magnified among us. And to beg him in the person and power of his spirit to draw near in a way that we have not yet experienced. That he would rend the heavens and that he would come down and draw near to his people. That he would save the lost and that he would sanctify his church. It is time. For judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your sufficient word. We pray that the truths that we find in it would resonate in our hearts, that by your grace we would live in light of the reality of who Christ is for us. God, I pray that you would save souls that are holding back from responding in repentance this morning, that you would draw them to yourself, that you would work mightily in them for your own glory, that you would rescue them from sin. God, we do ask with the prophet, where are you? Where are your zeal and your compassion? God, please don't restrain your kindnesses towards us. Open the portals of heaven. 
and let your mercy flood into our lives in order that we might live every moment of every day fully engaged with who you are and what you've called us to do, that we might walk closely with you, repenting of sin and trusting you in an ongoing fashion. God, you alone are worthy of worship and praise. You alone can accomplish these things. It's you who has saved us through the work of your own dear son. God, won't you draw near? Hear our prayers and be the help of your people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.